Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. This video is going to be some sort of a sequel to the one titled How to Achieve Realism in 3D, uh, in which I will be talking about some practical tips, mostly regarding materials. This is pertaining to Octane, but it can obviously be applied to other render engines. And we will just be talking about this uh, simple scene here in front of us. The first thing I want to mention is how to model these kind of, uh, I think they're called cornices. In Blender, it's it's very easy. Uh, so let's say you start with a plane. I'm gonna move it up a bit, scale it, and then uh, I'll extrude this edge. So you select the edge in which you want the, to have the corner, the cornice. Shift D to duplicate, B to separate by selection, and this is our edge. And then you can just uh, press F3 and then convert. To curve. Now this object is going to be a curve, you're gonna go down to bevel, profile, in preset you specify you want cornice molding and here you you're gonna have to up the resolution to something like 30, sorry my caps lock was off, 32 and then the depth. So you get this kind of shape, it's exactly this one and if you want it to, to be only on one side Instead of all sides, you can just, uh, here in uh, fill mode, it's set to full, you can set it to back if you want it to be uh, at the bottom, front, or half, depending on where you want it to be. Yeah, this is how you make this kind of uh, cornices. If you go to the materials tab, uh, you can notice that I have my textures here plugged into my universal material. And the way you set this up is uh, using a, an add-on. It's a custom build for a node wrangler. It's built for Octane. You can find it on this website. You can download it for free. Uh, I'm using the version 1.2.2. It's older than this, but it's working. As long as it's not broken, I'm, it's fine for me. And uh, as you can see, it uses this old image texture inputs. The new ones are uh, more optimized, I think. So if we look up image, you have this one, RGB image for albedo for instance, or color data, and then you have the grayscale image, which is, uh, as the name suggests, grayscale, so it's maybe more optimized in terms of data, it only uses one channel. Uh, whereas these ones that are used by the node wrangler are old ones, and they don't make a difference between the two, but it's just, it's just for uh, optimization purposes, it's not very, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't pose a problem really, in terms of how your texture will look. And uh, speaking of optimization, there is something general about Blender is here in Octane when you do your tryouts, for instance, you change your HDRIs, you try different materials, you add different lights and then you remove them. If you go here and then select Orphan da Data, you will see all the things you added in your scene. The fact that you remove them from your scene does not remove the data from, uh, from your Blender file. So here, for instance, you can have, I have two area lights that are not used. Uh, the one I'm using here is to this side. It's, uh, it's called, uh, hold on, let me check. This one, it's called Octane Area Light. So the other two I'm not using, Area and Octane Spotlight. We, I also have a material called Bottom Base that I'm not using. So in order to maybe save some uh, RAM and then clear your uh, GPU's RAM, you can use this button, Purge then press ok now it will remove all the unused data blocks so yeah maybe it will optimize your scene a bit if it's if you notice it's getting slower let's get back to our leather material so the the most important node here and the one i want to talk about is this one color correction uh you also have a similar one in cycles uh, i got this leather texture from um quixel mega scans i think but I think it, it was black, so I wanted to change the color a little bit to match uh, that of the wood. So I'm using this node here. And this node is, has, a, has a lot of, of parameters to tweak, but only gonna uh, change usually the hue, the saturation and the gamma, sometimes the contrast. This just allows you to change the colors of your texture, so uh, you don't really have to use a, the exact color that the texture has, you can change it to your liking. To match something you want so don't be afraid to experiment that way be careful when you load your textures with the node wrangler the texture displacement by default 
comes with a level detail of detail of 1k you want to change that to match the uh, the resolution of your texture in my case in my case it's a 4k texture the height is also set to 0.1 which is uh, too much so you want to set it to something lower like 0.01 in my case i put it to 0.04 because i wanted the leather to be uh, more prominent but uh, yeah you just want to make sure you have this set up right because otherwise your texture is going to lock off in regards to what I talked about in my previous video about adding detail and imperfections, if we zoom into our cornice here, you can see that I added a little bit of a chipping and imperfections to the plaster. This is a very small detail, but if, if the viewer notices it, it adds a level of realism. So you can do this with Octane easily using the noise texture node the one i'm using here is uh chips it's called yeah the noise type is chips you, by default it's it's on perlin i switched it to chips and then i plug the transform value into the uvw transform to scale it down a bit you can access a node viewer uh, in octane with the node wrangler pressing control shift and then clicking on the texture uh, i i also uh, inserted a gradient map so i'll do it on this one instead here you, because if I do it on this one, yeah, it's, it's a little different. I had way too many values, so I wanted to uh, to maybe make them a little more prominent. That's why I added a gradient map. <coughs> so now you can see you can play with the size of your uh, chip in. Here it's too small. Here one maybe, yeah. And then I, I plugged the result into uh, the bump. That's why you have the result you see here. It's, it's very easy to achieve, it doesn't take that long, but you can add a level of detail to your scene. I did something similar with the metallic plant vase here. Yeah, you can see it's the same. This time it's just a normal, regular Perlin noise. Uh, no, sorry, I'm mistaken. This is, uh, this is dirt. This is the dirt. So by default, hold on, let me switch to the the normal material by default it was like this that would let the texture load and I just thought it looked way too smooth for dirt that's why I decided to add some uh, noise texture as bump and if we switch to, to this one you'll see the result is gonna be a lot better you can see it's more akin to uh, wet dirt and uh, plants now if I switch back to the pot this one you can see I have I have again uh, yeah, this one, instead of procedural noise, I used uh, textures, roughness imperfection textures. Uh, if we take a look at this one, yeah, this one is just, it's very subtle, it's barely visible. Uh, and this one, yeah, this one is just also some chip in, or some, uh, some imperfections on the vase that I plugged into the bump. So yeah, you can, you can barely see them here, but with the full resolution image it's uh, it, it looks a little better as for the plant i had the i had to mix between the regular plant material the one that i imported with a new universal material uh, with a transmission set yeah set to a value close to 1 so now you can see hold on let me zoom on the plant it's a mixture of hold on i'll disable Plus processing. So you can see if I switch back to my, this is my first material. It's it's very translucent, and the second material is this one. It doesn't let through a lot of light because there is no translucency in this one. So I just thought about mixing the two a little bit to have uh, the plant look a little more, a little better in terms of how much light it lets through. As for the lighting, it's fairly simple. I have, of course, as I said, an HDRI. It's the best source of lighting you can use. I got this one from Polyhaven, uh, but I also have this area light here to add a bit of a shine to the whole room. And uh, obviously I followed that up with a little bit of post Octane's post-processor to add bloom and glare. Uh, yeah, uh, a tip about bloom and glare is don't be afraid to pump these up. Uh, you can go to... I mean, depends on the scene, but... Sometimes I go to 500 if I want, and then instead of instead of uh, changing the values of the bloom and the glare, 
play with the cutoff. It's the value, it's this uh, parameter decides how much lumen glare you want to go through in your scene. So as you can see if I... Uh, no, sorry, hold on. Let's put this back to 30. You can see if I if I up this value, there is, it's like these two values are set to zero. There is no no bloom. But then if I go down, you can see a less true a little. So I think this having this parameter uh, be controlled is is a more efficient way. Last but not least, make sure to export your uh, image as an EXR, as I said in my previous video. So you set the file format to Open EXR. The color is set to RGB because we don't have. Uh, an alpha channel in our image and the codec I usually uh, set it up to PIS which I heard uh, from a lot of people say it's a good algorithm for compression and then for the color depth uh, I set it to float half you'll notice that uh, here it says 32 bit color channels but when we import it to Photoshop I think uh, Photoshop interprets this one as 64 so when it's float half it's uh, it's already 32 in Photoshop because uh, for Photoshop, if we want to use Camera Raw, we're going to have to switch the photo to a 16-bit uh, color. Whereas the half one is already 32, so I think going with float here is, is fine. And shortly I will show you how, of course, you import uh, the image into Photoshop to do your post-processing. So here we are uh, in Photoshop. Uh, apparently GIMP is also able to uh, manipulate EXR images, but I'm not, I'm not sure, I may be mistaken, you, you need to look that up to see. Uh, as for Photoshop, you're going to have to use an add-on, a free one, called EXR-IO. It's a free plugin. And it's very useful as well uh, in Blender when you want to import a multi-layer EXR, so you can rebuild your scene and tweak it to your liking. Uh, so let's just drag our image. Once you install the, the software, it will suggest to open open it. Uh, you can leave the, these parameters as is. Uh, you can see it also supports crypto mask, which is very useful. You will notice that the colors of your image are washed out and do not look the same as the output of your uh, Blender file. So to fix that, you're going to have to add uh, an exposure filter here. And then you set the gamma correction to 0 0.4545, which is uh, 1 divided by 2.2. So 0. 45, 45. Now you'll see you'll get the same output uh, as in uh, Blender. And now once you, you've done that, you can go to layer, uh, sorry, image I mean, mode. This is where I told you that even though we exported it as a half float, it's still, uh, Photoshop still sees it as a 30 bits per channel image. So you're going to have to switch to 16. Merge. And now you can color grade and tweak your image however you like. Uh, usually you can go with auto here as a starting point and then change it as you like it depends usually on the picture in this case it doesn't look that good um, so what I do is you can use the shortcuts the hotkeys shift shift allows you to uh, when you shift and then click on a parameter it will adjust it to auto but only that parameter so you can uh, have that as a starting point and then change it later on uh, but you also have alt to reset the parameter to its default value so that's how I usually go about it once you're done with your image, you can just export it as a as a JPEG. I usually choose JPEG because it's fairly compact compared to PNG, and uh, you're good to go. So I hope you learned something from this video, uh, and I wish you a great day. Bye.